We do have a small audience today. Uh, I have Tim, our uh, horticulturist here at the Arboretum. He's going to be kind of uh, filling in with me and hopefully helping out here and there. And we also have our interns out here as a little small audience. And it looks like one of them was smart and brought ice cream with her uh, from yesterday. We had an ice cream social, just a, it's a nice little thing we do with the volunteers and the interns together. Uh, of course, everyone's here to learn about uh, how to container garden or water garden or create water garden containers. And that's what we're talking about today. And I think maybe one of the first things I should show is a water lily because the water lilies are probably the, um, the strangest plant for a lot of people. We got one right down here. Uh, there's nothing really too different about them. They're just a normal plant. You can tell they live in a pot in a container water garden, even just a normal water garden. We have soil in here, they have leaves. They even have a little flower coming up on them in this case, which is awesome. Uh, there, there are a couple of interesting things, at least one thing that I think is interesting. If I'm remembering my facts correctly, Nymphaea, the genus for water lilies, is the only um, genera that has plants where the petiole can get longer once it's matured. And if you think about that, that makes sense. They live in lakes, which might flood, so the water level goes up. Those leaves have to be on top of the water, and for them to do that, the leaves have to keep on expanding. So this, of course, is the petiole for the uh, water lily, and these can get higher or longer and longer as the water level goes higher and higher. Water lilies don't like it too deep. About six feet is about as deep as they can go in most cases at the absolute depth or highest depth. Um, in a water garden at home, a foot is more than enough. So don't worry about putting them all, all that deep. They're perfectly fine. You can see we have some in the uh, water garden over here to my right. Uh, that's just uh, one over here in the cascade and that one's in a pot rather similar to this. And the other big difference for water garden pots are containers and you, you just throw everything you've learned in regular classes and, and how-tos for doing a container garden, you do not plant in potting soil, at least in most cases. Potting soil floats and you make a big mess. This is actually planted in just regular topsoil from my backyard, and that's all it is. So this pot weighs a small ton and it's actually quite heavy to lift. Uh, the one good part is once you put it in water, they're a lot lighter, so they are more maneuverable in that case. So just use regular soil. We don't have a regular water lily uh, rhizome to show today, so much to Tim's horror, we have an iris rhizome. I mean, it's a bearded attack. Bearded iris, to make matters they worse hate water. mind. They hate water. <laughs> so we're going to be using your imagination today. Pretend this is a water lily. It's of course not pretend and you'll be good to go. A normal water lily should be in a wide or a hardy water lily should be in a wide, shallow container. So this is maybe about a foot and a half wide or so. And it's actually not all that tall. It's about, uh, I don't know, eight, eight 10 inches tall. Dish pans work out really well. Um, I would definitely recommend that you use a dark colored container. Black, of course, is perfect. You get a nice, um, I don't know, purple or blue dish pan and you put it in a water garden or even a container water garden, you're gonna see it, at least until algae grows on it. So just go ahead and get black. Black always works out really good. And I mentioned earlier that we use field soil and that's all we have. Tim's moving it over. This does have a little bit of wood in it. It's not the best for that, but it, it, it'll work. It's a good demo. And you just fill your container up. We probably should have done the official demonstration and had one in the oven all ready to go, <laughs> but we didn't. I quite often like to work with uh, moist soil already, um, just because that means there's a whole lot less to have to moisten. So when you're doing your own uh, planting a water garden plant, just wet the soil ahead of time. I also like to um, uh, put my containers that I've recently potted just in a bucket because soil is gonna wind up bubbling quite a bit when you pot up a water garden plant and bubbling pot or bubbling uh, top soil uh, in a water garden makes a huge mess. You will wind up with dirty water quite possibly for weeks and you don't want something like that. We're gonna go ahead and fill it pretty close to the top because we don't have to water this. It's inside of a water garden. We don't need to worry about having a little bit of lip to hold the water. And that's probably good enough. We're gonna 
pretend that that's full and we're close. There's really nothing to planting a hardy water lily, but there is one little extra uh, secret. You find the side of the uh, rhizome that you've cut and you put that towards the outside of the pot and you aim the growing parts of the rhizome towards the center. Because just like this bearded iris, they travel as they, as they grow. So it'll go further and further towards the inside of the container. Um, if the part of the rhizome looks like it's dead, you can cut that part off to make it a little bit shorter. That's just something like doing that. And it's just a matter of sinking it. Just put it down to the soil, just like a bearded iris. So it's good demo, Tim, right? Yeah. Okay, we got him to agree once. And you put them right at the ground level. You don't bury it 100%. You just put it right at the ground level. And that's all you have to do for potting a water lily. It's not hard to do, nothing terribly magical about it. But one of the main problems you'll have with something like this, when you put it in your water, water lilies are loaded in air. The leaf blades have air inside of them. The rhizome is full of air. So this will float right out of your water garden or right out of the pot when you put it in the water garden. So you just get a rock or a brick and you put it on top of it. Don't put it on top of the growing point. Put it on top of the rhizome and that'll help hold it in. Because uh, otherwise it'll just pop right out and make a mess. And Tim's going to bring over some gravel. Gravel is not essential. It's great if you have a pond and you're putting your water lily into a pond because uh, fish do like to suck on the uh, soil and uh, see if they can find any food in it. And as they do that over and over and over again, uh, over weeks and weeks, they start to empty water gardens or water garden um, potted plants. So gravel on top of it that's bigger than they can really get inside their mouth will help prevent them from digging into the soil. So it's just a matter of putting a small layer of soil. And of course, here at the Arboretum, we love permatil. We always have permatil. So we're just putting permatil around it. And I'm gonna go ahead and lift up my little brick so I can get that open so I can cover it. And just make, whoops, there's my shovel. It's just a light layer just to keep the, uh, the fish out of it. So the fish in a pond are your squirrels that you're usually are dealing with. So just protect a little bit. Don't put inches and inches of gravel in it. There's no reason to do that. Just enough to keep your water lily uh, soils protected from the fish. So just a small little layer. And um, again, if you have a container big enough, put this inside of it first, let it make its mess inside there. You can leave it in there overnight and then pop it into your pond the next day. You have a much cleaner pond in that case. And if you're doing a water garden container like I had over here, um, you can at least empty that very easily to take care of that. And, um, so that should be a, a nice, nice, easy way. So water lilies are really simple to do. Uh, we do have our audio attached today. So if anyone has any questions for planting water lilies or how they can manage them, go ahead and ask. The one thing I did forget, I just remembered, water lilies and other aquatic plants love fertilizer. They grow extensively if they have it. So fertilize your water lilies. You get a lot more flowers in that case. Water lilies will flower as long as they are actively growing. So the more they grow, the more they're gonna flower. And to make them grow, fertilize them. High nitrogen works out very well, but there is a flip side problem to that. Algae also loves fertilizer. And if you just put the fertilizer inside your water, you can turn your pond to pea soup green, and <laughs> it's gonna be that way for a long time. So when you're fertilizing aquatic plants, get the fertilizer down inside the soil. Establish plants like this, or like this one's gonna be, you can buy fertilizer spikes, push the gravel aside just a little bit, shove that spike down into the soil, and then cover it back up with soil so it doesn't leak into the water uh, all that much, and then put your gravel back on top of it. When you're planting a plant like this, you can just sprinkle some loose uh, fertilizer into it and just cover up with soil. And no, there's no fertilizer labeled for water lilies out there for sale at your garden center. You might find some spikes that are labeled for that. Just a normal fertilizer for flowering plants is perfectly fine. It's nothing magical. Nitrogen is what's gonna make them grow and that'll make them flower. Uh, so go ahead and fertilize, but be careful, not too much, because you'll make your water green. How about questions, anyone? Anyone have any questions? They're all quiet. How about a wonderful interns? Any questions over there? Okay. Um, you were saying that the pitio grows with like the flooding. Yep. So how fast does it grow? They can actually, if it's not all that deep, they can be corrected by the next morning. Oh, wow. Yeah, so if you have a, 
heavy rain during the day, overnight they will expand and, and be right back up. So it's, it's pretty fast. What do they do when like, there's like a drought and it goes down? So they then they just have really long petioles yeah. and they just have their leaves further out. They, they, don't, they don't shrink. Yeah. They, just, they just keep on growing. Yeah. But that is not true from lotus. Do not bury lotus leaves because they will die. They do not continue to expand. They just grow and, and they stay put after that. So we have a few other plants. We're just going to move a few things. Let's move this table out of the way, I think, okay. Tim. Great. I think that looks out pretty good. So another part of your water garden, uh, uh, whether it's a container water garden, also just a normal pond that you have in your backyard, could be any of your um, emergent plants or your marginals is what they're called in water gardening. And we have just a few samples over here. And I'll show you some of my personal favorites that I use in my water gardens at home. And I'm going to, uh, just to do a little correction of that, I'm going to show you how or what size pots I use first. So at, at my house on my back porch, I often have cannas. It's what I've had the last couple of years. And uh, previous to that, I had a lot of elephant ears. And I grow them in just this size black plastic pot because there are a lot of um, uh, decorative containers that you can buy that, have, that don't have holes in the bottom that you can put this container inside of. And that other container is one that will hold water and this will hold your plants. And I keep them separate because over the winter time, I can just take this out and do whatever I want to with it. A canna or an elephant ear doesn't need or doesn't even want water in the winter time. So I just take this, I'm gonna pop them in my basement and keep my decorative containers somewhere else or even replant it with a different kind of a plant. But I go ahead and use those. When you're doing a container like this inside of another container that's just about the same size, you can use potting soil in this case because while it might float, it doesn't float all that much and it's held off by the sides of the larger container. So I, I quite often for my cannas, my elephant deers, I just use potting soil because this full of regular topsoil, that's gonna weigh a lot. That's gonna weigh quite a bit. And interestingly, a container like this inside of another container, that just body of water might be enough to even attract things like tree frogs. We usually have tree frog tadpoles in our containers uh, throughout the year, which is always fun. And we'll attract dragonflies and some other creatures. And I'm going to have Tim, actually I'm going to have one of the interns go inside of where my office is. There's a plastic bag that's red and I have mosquito bits inside of it. So one of you go hop into the offices you over guys, there. I'll get it. Tim will get it. Apparently don't know where my office is. Uh, one problem you might run into with water gardens, of course, especially your smaller containers that don't have fish is gonna be a mosquito problem. And that will definitely be true for when you first plant it uh, for the first uh, few weeks at least. Um, so a mosquito dunk is perfectly fine. A mosquito dunk is made for a pond, a large body of water. So you might wanna get a product called Mosquito Bits. And that one you can measure out by the teaspoon. And I think, I can't remember the instructions. I just did it or, or my mom just did it. And I think it was like one teaspoon for 25 square feet. So a container like that, you don't even need to do one little teaspoon. So this is mosquito bits. It's just mosquito dunks all loose. You're not buying a little specialty product that says a little uh, specialty uh, shape and you're not wasting a lot. So mosquito dunks are a good one. And another helpful hint that I was not aware of, if you read the directions on mosquito dunks and mosquito bits, you can also use these to treat um, gnats in your house plants. I didn't know that. Did you know that? I just saw it on the bag as I was walking out. It says fungus gnats. That's how I saw it. I thought it was pretty cool. So if you get a poinsettia and you bring it inside your house around Christmas time, you have fungal gnats in it, put some of your mosquito bits in it. That'll, uh, that'll treat them. I had no clue. I can't tell you how many people have asked me how to get rid of um, gnats out of soil in a house plant. I have never known that that was going to work until we got that package. So is recently. that Bacillus thuringiensis? I yeah, look, uh, so. uh, Mosquito Bits is BT, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's very similar to the one you use for caterpillars, but I think it's a different variety. So like kind of like a, just a different diff, di yeah. a different strain. I know the, for potato beetles, it's uh, San Diego strain. Yeah, there you go. No, I don't know what it is for the others. So in containers like this at home, I have right now cannas. And I really like the cannas on my back porch because uh, they just have really attractive foliage. They're, they're big, they're tropical, the flowers can be pretty. And I'll just show you a couple of the cultivars. These unfortunately do have that little worm that seals the leaves up so they're not looking perfect. 
Uh, if you can keep up on them and, and keep it off of them, it's a little bit better. Insecticides don't work all that well from what I've heard with these because they're sealed up inside the plant and they're kind of away from the insecticide. So physical removal usually works out best. Uh, this one here is a cultivar that we have called uh, African, was it African, African Sunset? Sunset? African Sunset. To me, it looks just like uh, Tropicana, which you can readily find at uh, garden centers. And I believe the cultivar for that one is called Phazon. Uh, love, love Tropicana. This cultivar here is called Bengal Tiger. And this is one that I actually got from the person that is helping me record today. I got this from Alexander and his wife, Carol. They asked me if I wanted it. I told them I'd know that I had too many plants. And I changed my mind that later that day. I went to the uh, staff building, got one, and it's been one of my favorites. So thank you, Carol. Thank you, Alexander. Love it to death. Big orange flowers on that one. And by the way, African Sunset, Tropicana has orange flowers, lovely. And this is another favorite because it can't make up its mind. This is a cultivar called Cleopatra. And it has streaks of purple and streaks of green all in the same leaf. And what's really cool about this one is this one flowers. The flowers do the same thing. They'll be streaked red or green. No, oh, yellow. Yellow, yellow, yellow. <laughs> so red, red and yellow. The yellow part is from the green and the red comes from the burgundy side. So that's just a really interesting effect. So grow these in a container on your back porch instead of a water gallon or a water garden. They're wonderful. One extra added benefit that I did not mention for water garden plants, you can go on vacation for a week or two weeks. They're sitting in water. You don't have to have your neighbor or family or friends take care of your potted plants for you and worry about them because they're just sitting in water. It's not gonna go anywhere. Uh, just ask someone maybe once just to check the water level and just put a bunch in there. So. They're not gonna dry out overnight. That's wonderful, I think it's great. Uh, another favorite is uh, elephant ears. And we put them in the pond per Tim's suggestion because they wilt fast. Tim, put you on the spot. What's the cultivar of the yellow one? I don't know offhand. We stumped him. It's, it's, is it Maui Gold or something? It's one of the Could Hawaiian gold. series. So I'm this is just sure a, a is. nice, lovely uh, golden leaf one. Uh, elephant ears come in a huge array of really cool cultivars, really great colors. This is one that we have over in Asian Valley, and I think it was labeled Fontanesiana. It's a green and form And this now. is a green form of it. I think it's Personally, I like the purple leaf form of it. I think that's lovely, but what's really nice about this kind is this has extra shiny foliage that just looks super tropical and is really awesome in a container garden. It's super tall too. And they're very tall. And one little extra neat thing about these, these actually make runners. I don't know if the green one does, but the purple one does. It makes runners. And I have mine, or I used to have mine on top of my porch, and the runners would hang down off the back of the porch like a spider plant. And then they make little elephant ears that would come up out of them. So that's kind of neat on the back of the porch. I always liked my Fontanesiana. I got rid of my elephant, elephant ears a couple of years ago just because I wanted to change. And then here's one called Aloha. This one is in our Monocot garden. And you can tell that this one probably has the genetics or some of the genetics from Fontanesiana because it has the shiny foliage to it. Beautiful, beautiful. And I'm assuming with the name Aloha that it came from that wonderful plant breeder out there in Hawaii that works with Tony and has introduced so many awesome cultivars of elephant ears. If you ever need a source of them, Tony has an amazing array of elephant ears. With elephant ears, one thing you have to worry about when you transplant them <laughs> is they may not look all that great when you transplant them. They become very unhappy. The leaves wilt, but don't worry about that. Just cut it off. It's gonna look ugly. They'll grow new ones real soon, but there you go. There's the base of the elephant ear, not much to plant. You can probably guess if you did have to plant this, it'd probably fall over if you need to cut off anyway. So not, not much down there. Here you go, here's the runners. So this, this one also runners. I got this plant, some of our other demonstrations from uh, Marilyn and Bill, who are probably here in the audience today. Thank you, Marilyn and Bill, for your demo plants. This is a run, red stem cultivar they have. It's a beautiful planting at their home. It has filled an entire bed because this one spreads by those runners. They can, they can conquer the world really quickly. What else do we have over there? Oh, a chorus. Here's another one that I've had in, uh, uh, actually had this one in a bucket of water for a long time, but I've added this one to my water garden recently. 
I did the cultivar called Ogon. And Tim, what is this one? Just Variegata? That's just Variegata. So this one's Variegata. I think we can get a little bit closer to it. So this one has green streaks and gold streaks, whereas Ogon is uh, primarily just pure gold. These are a great water plants. Uh, look great in a container water garden. They can be a little accessory in there. They will grow in a normal container garden as well. They don't need to be sitting in water. You can put them in your landscape. I have added these to my back pond in my uh, home landscape because these have one, actually a couple really cool special features. This is one that grows very well in shade. Most of your water garden plants love sun. They don't handle shade at all. Full sun is an absolute requirement for most of them. And interestingly, this is one of the very few aquatic plants that's evergreen. Most of your water garden plants are deciduous, so they're gone all winter long. Whereas this one looks pretty much the same year round and always looks good. I have two huge clutches in my back pond. They're great. The fish love them. They lay eggs in them. I wish they would stop. We have too many babies, uh, but it's a great water plant. And all those roots hanging down the pond are just a great filtration for the water as well. Who's next? Ooh, a couple two, cool two ones. Out. A couple of my favorites have both of these as well. Uh, we'll do the taller one first. This is Umbrella Palm. Umbrella Palm is another one that would be great in a container water garden, a regular water garden, or even just in your home landscape. We've had some for sale up there at the plant buggy recently. I'll bet you we'll probably have some more in the near future. Great landscape plant. Um, just pop that up as you would any other uh, container plant. Just use heavy soil so it doesn't float on you. One little interesting uh, uh, fact about this one, what you're seeing above ground are flowers. This is all flower structure. The leaves are these little brown icky things down at the bottom you're not really paying attention to. And you can propagate this one by dividing the roots, but that's hard to do. You can propagate them by flowers, not seeds. They'll actually reproduce vegetatively by the flowers. You can take this, put it just a little bit of shallow soil with the leaves, or the, uh, I will call them leaves, popping up out of the soil, and that'll make a new plant. Or if you already have one, just break one of these, bend it off to the bottom or bend it off, make sure this is inside the water and that'll make a new plant. Really cool, awesome plant. Uh, looks very tropical, it is, but this one is hardy in our area. So it's hardy to zone 7B. I'm not sure about zone seven, so it may not go all that further, but even further north would be a good temporary plant. You can always bring it inside if you wanted to. Another one is the Egyptian paper plant. Love this one. Not very hardy, it might make it occasionally, but not very often. The Egyptian paper plant has more of the frilly plume at the top versus being leafy. This one does not propagate at all from this part. So don't come here to the Arboretum, cut them all off and propagate them. It won't do it. I've tried, they do not do it. But the base grows just the same. This is all flowers above ground. Um, this is a small one. And I forget the cultivar name, it's Prince in the name, Tim. Oh, there's a, that's one of the new ones that's out in the trial. I looked at the name this morning. I guess we I can't, can't bring Tim to these anymore, can we? I brought him over here to help out with cultivar names. and Cultivar, no, I'm not good and at I'll it. And I've stumped him on Paris. both. It has Prince in the name. It's Prince a, Tut, maybe. Prince Tut. Something like that. Yeah, it would make something. sense. Could be Prince Tut. Hopefully, Dennis can help you out with it in the chat. Instead of King get the name Tut, for Prince you. Tut. Uh, but this one is a smaller, more diminutive one. We have a nice planting of them in the color trial. So go take a look at them over there. Beautiful planting containers. And, oh, this is, this is actually another one that I used to have in my container gardens at home. This is a plant called Thalia. And I believe the full name, ooh, it's thundering. How wonderful is that? It's Thalia dilbata. And there's a different one that I believe is red stem, never had that one. Uh, this is a plant called Thalia. Another common name is water canna. Because uh, it kind of looks like canna, doesn't it? Sadly, uh, Tim just told me it gets the same little worm that canna gets, so it does get the little reef rollers. You need to pull them out. Uh, you don't want to be sp uh, spraying uh, uh, insecticides in your water garden. So if you've got your water garden, don't spray insecticides there. You might kill your fish. One interesting thing about Thalia, at least I thought it was interesting, hummingbirds love it. I wouldn't think they do. Uh, Alexander, come over here to those flowers on that Thalia. I think we can get in on those quite nicely. They're not tubular shaped and they're not red. So you think you wouldn't think hummingbirds would go after them, but hummingbirds love Thalia. I had a pot in one of my back porch and it was the best plant I had that year. In fact, it's been my best plant ever for hummingbirds. So I don't know why they liked it, but maybe uh, Alexandra can also show a little bit of the, um, the leaf damage from the caterpillar. Caterpillar? 
Yeah, Caterpillar that gets it. They're not real nice. But it doesn't look anywhere near as bad as Canna. I've seen them actually rolled. Have you? The, the, I don't think that's the same one. There's a couple of things that will eat them. But... So I'm going to get Tim to show you something else because I don't want to touch it. <laughs> you can talk about it? Or... I'll talk about it, yeah. So was this a flower? This was a flower stalk. Here's the, the flower stalk. There, there we go. <laughs> so this is a plant called Echinodorus, and I forget its full name. Tim, do you know I don't it? remember the species. Oh, this wait, is land to la uh, Lady, I think, was the... the the cultivar that was given to this We stumped one. Tim a third time. So yeah. hopefully Dennis can take care of us in the chat. It's uh, a plant called Echinodorus. It's a sword. And these will have a uh, little white flower spike that pops up mm. on it. But just like, I don't know what Tim's doing. I saw one somewhere. Oh, oh, here it is. Here we go. There we go. And just like a, a spider plant, these will make little babies on their flowers. And they'll just bring back down, or they'll get heavy, fall down to the water, and they will root. And in this case, it turned into that. Yeah, I, this is one that was loose in one of our other water gardens from the flower stalk last year, actually. And this Echinodorus, I do like. This one's beautiful, has really uh, corrugated leaves, puckered leaves. They're really nice and thick, and they're a beautiful green. It's great. We have a cultivar over there in the water garden, which we used to call Silver There's Queen. There's still a tiny bit of it. It doesn't... I don't like it. I have never liked it's that It's never one. emerged in the water. Yeah, I This don't thing like is it. three feet tall, four feet tall in the water. This would, this would be a showstopper of a container yeah. uh, um, plant for a water garden. It and would if be it, phenomenal. If anybody uh, has an aquarium and has had an Amazon sword, that's more or less what this is. It's just yep. on steroids. It's a big one. Love it. That one's a great one. And I have a little tiny one. <laughs> <laughs> a tortured soul. Yeah, a little, little tortured soul. I didn't have this one in a water garden. I just would water it and it didn't like it, but it's in a water garden now. So it's starting to grow and, and looking better. So it's, it's, it's going. And this is propagated from a flower or from the uh, offshoot. Here's another fun one that I've liked. This is a um, lizard's tail. And this is one from here at the Arboretum. We used to have it over here, but another plant has eaten it up. And the cultivar for this one, Tim, Oh my gosh. I, I don't I remember. Um, and I think it's supposed to have the green splotch in it, like you said. Yeah, it I think doesn't. so. So, um, so this is a, a, a gold. Um, so I think mine form. is actually a gold form of the one we had here in the Cascade it's, that was variegated, had a green center. Jesse and Perry found the other on the one. Outside. And I can't think, it's one of the counties from, it's named after one of the counties in North yeah. Carolina. So hopefully uh, Dennis can take care of you in the chat. Lizard's tail's nice. It makes a flower. This is a spent flower. And it usually dangles over, and it just kind of looks like a little lizard's tail, and that's why it gets its name. This is one that you don't want to plant in an earthen bottom pond because you may curse yourself for years and years and years on because it makes runners. Look, it's already popping out of the pot, and there's a runner right there, so it can take over. Just keep it in a nice uh, constrained spot. This is its and cousin. Is it, is it related? They're related. Oh, no wonder why they're both bad. Yes. Although... That's Asian. This is I, American. I personally like, oh, this, this one's native, so it can't do wrong, right? It can't do wrong in a home landscape. So here's another one. Uh, that's a, a danger plant. It's lovely. If you can keep it in a container, go right ahead. Don't plant a uh, hutinia, hutinea, whatever you want to call it, chameleon <laughs> plant in your home landscape. Don't put it in the ground. Always keep it in the pot. Um, so chameleon plant usually has a lovely variegated leaf. I can see a few of them on here. The, and uh, the variegated one does grow slower. The problem comes in, it's not a very stable cultivar and it might change the green. And green is very strong grower and it will spread. If you want any proof of that, just ask Mark Wethington, our director, about his new home uh -oh. and his problem that he has with chameleon plant. His former homeowner planted it. Oh, okay. And I think it's Mark's bane of existence in his landscape. But you're not gonna get rid of it. Another bane. No. Oh, but this one's good in a container. In a container. So here's another one. Don't let one. it in the ground either. Here's another one that spreads. And this is also one of the rare ones that's evergreen. Uh, this is horsetail. And horsetail is a great plant in a container. Don't keep it anywhere where it's going to spread because it will spread all over the place. I had a little tiny dwarf one that I loved. It was cute. It stayed there for a couple of years. And I think secretly it was spreading underneath all of my rocks in my water garden because one year it popped up and I think it was almost across the entire pond periphery and I had to pull all the rocks out to get rid of it. It was not fun, so be careful. But this is a cool plant and it's, again, it's one of the rare evergreens, so it's year round interest. Another interesting fun fact is this one is often called scouring rush. This is one of the few plants that actually has silicon 
in the cells and it has it um, on the outside so it uh, is rather rough and the uh, people on the prairies used to use this to clean pots. So that's where scouring, um, scouring brush came from, the name wise. And this is a little sad looking now, but. Yeah, this one, this one wasn't happy in traffic. This is Pickerel Rush. It's another personal favorite. It has a little heart-shaped leaf, thus the name. This is Pontidaria cordata, heart-shaped leaf. And these have purple flowers on them. They're lovely. Um, uh, a fun little thing about this, the flowers come out of the leaf, leaf stem. So the flower will just pop up out of this. Well, that's kind of cool. But this is a great container plant. Uh, it's a great pollinator one. always bees on it. I think I may have had hummingbirds on it. I'm not sure about that. They go crazy after Thalia. So plant Thalia if you want hummingbirds. But the um, pickerel rush is great. There's another one that's often called Pontidaria lanceolata. I don't know if that's a proper name for it. It might be just a Thinner. subspecies variety, a weird cultivar. It has much longer, narrower leaves and supposedly is not as hardy. But that's another lovely one too. I like I like that one quite a bit. Do you want this one? Yeah, I can show that one. It's sad, but yeah. So irises are also great water garden plants. Louisiana irises uh, are wonderful for water garden plants. Um, their foliage usually looks pretty good throughout the growing season. If you like flowers, they mainly flower for about two weeks out of the year, so they may not be the best in a, a container water garden because it may not be that interesting for you throughout most of the season. So maybe think twice about an iris, but they're still fun nonetheless. I like irises. Do they want to do questions? But you can also do it just in your landscape. They're perfectly fine in the, in the dry grounds. So let's, oh, any questions about marginal plants since we had so many about water lilies? <laughs> oh, they're quiet. How about from the interns? Anything about aquatic uh, marginal plants? Nope, I stumped them too. So let's talk about the floaters. Floaters so are cool. This one is related to I yeah. think the so pickerel, pickerel rush. Where'd he go already? Oh, I put it over. You threw him down here. So one of pickerel probably didn't even need it. We just covered it. One of pickerel rush's infamous relatives is water hyacinth. And I, I looked it up to see if I'd be safe talking about this one today. This one does have a very deserved bad rap for it. It is rather vigorous and multiplies extensively. Um, I learned last night, this is not the one that is a federally listed invasive plant. That one is rooted water hyacinth, which grows on a long stem. This is the floating water hyacinth. That's its root system. They just bob along in the water. They have little uh, inflated bladders that keep them afloat in the water. And just because these are not federally listed invasive weeds, does not mean you grow them in your water garden and take them to Falls Lake and release them. Never do that. Don't release your water garden plants anywhere out in the wild. Keep them in your garden. These also make great compost. Put in your garden, in your compost, compost thing or compost pile. It's probably fine. Don't release them out in the wild. Lovely water garden plant. The root system hanging down inside the water also acts as a great nutrient filter. So that nitrogen I mentioned earlier that makes you all your water green. This is one of your solutions to keep your water clear. Keep floating plants. Don't release it. This is in full flower. Oh, this one's in full flower? I never yeah. even bothered to pay attention to them. Oh, that's, uh, that's decorative, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> oh, and these are really hard to plant. Done. Don't even worry about soil. So here's water lettuce, which is another one. And by the way, I got the water lettuce and water hyacinth also from Maryland. Thank you so much for sharing them with me. Uh, water lettuce is a, a fun little guy too for water gardens. Water lettuce seems like a little bit more shade. Uh, whereas water hyacinth can grow in sun to quite a bit of shade as well. Don't put this one in full sun, it kind of burns out. Uh, but look how long the root system is compared. That's, that's over a foot long for just a little tiny, uh, little tiny plant. As Tim mentioned, it's in full flower. I think they're related to the elephant ears, if I remember right, or I used to be classified in the erase E. Well, let's they, see if I can hold this steady they might enough have a different so you can family see now, the super decorative flower on it. They're giant. They have a spath and a spadix. There you go. Isn't that impressive? You just want to cut a bo bouquet of those for your uh, loved one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and again, they're really hard to plant. You just bop them in the soil and they're good. So they're, they're a natural for uh, uh, container garden plants. And here's another one that I know Tim does, a name, does know the name of. So Selvinia. we're going to ask Tim. What's Selvinia. The name? I don't know which species, oh, but it's Selvinia. Selvinia. And this is just a little floating fern. I use it in my aquarium. It takes over. I started with like a quarter of that stuff in Chris's hand. So do you think you need supplemental lighting for Selvinia in a, an aquarium? In aquarium, yes. Okay. I do need to give it light. I have an aquarium lights. 
<laughs> so but it floats. It does yeah, not like the disturbance. If I have one aquarium where the it moves too much and the plants have gotten tinier and tinier. They're almost just like a big um, duckweed at this point. But these are in <laughs> so one let, where let, they've gotten going and they don't move. Let's freak Tim out. No, 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 no. We don't want it in our Cascade Garden. So again, really hard to plants. Don't put them out in the wilds. Just don't do that. I did not mention not to do that for water lettuce. Don't put water lettuce out in your uh, streams and your, and your ponds and your lakes and your creeks. Don't do that. Um, I did read a little interesting factoid about water lettuce. They don't know where it's native to. Oh. There is evidence it is a U.S. native. There is evidence that it's uh, from Africa. There's evidence from South America, Central America. It's included in Egyptian hieroglyphs. But that was actually um, illustrated and described by early botanists from down in Florida in the 1700s. So there's, there's a chance either came over as ballast in a ship and survived the um, long transportation. I don't know how it would, maybe from seed. Um, so who knows? And by the way, it's actually in the fossil record for the United States. So who knows? We don't know. Um, and we have parrot's feather. Also got this from Maryland and Bill, so thank submerged. you. What'd you say? You can grow that one submerged as well. Yeah, you can grow this one. Uh, this makes a submerged plant or also a uh, little floating plant. So in a, in a little water garden, it just kind of looks like that. And this can be one that is your um, uh, spiller that they call in your container. It can, it can overhang the sides. It's just a little cutie for your water gardens. You can just kind of drape it. The uh, stems you can put in a small pot just for anchorage, although it's perfectly fine floating. And Tim, I think somewhere we have anacris here too. Oh, I didn't even see that. Okay, you said that earlier. I think it might be buried. I l used to have it all through the cascade, but it's well, we've lost it. I'm not finding it. it. Some yes. of your submerged plants like anacris or foxtail would also make a good contribution or a good addition to a water garden uh, like this one. Those just go down to the bottom of the pond. You can get, put little tiny metal weights on them to make them sink. Just attach them to a rock somehow or put them in a little small pot. They only use their roots for anchorage. They don't really use the roots for nutrient and water absorption. They're sitting in it. They do all that through their foliage. And Tim's going to show you a plant. Chris loves this he one. Likes. I don't like this one, so we'll let Tim. I won't. This. I can't remember the Latin though for it, but it's it's variegated uh, water celery. I think yep. is a common yep. name. Um, actually, there's an enormous patch just over here. And that's why I don't like it because it'll conquer the world. But it, it it is pretty. It's a nice filler. Um, among, especially in contrast to things like the water lily leaves or the thalia. It's a finer leaf that's related to the carrot. And actually it's in flower in there. There are umbels on it, uh, which you'd have like on um, uh, Queen Anne's lace. So, or carrot flowers, so. I think my main problem with it is it chokes things out yeah. if you have them with it. So here's a little flower. Let's see if I can get that one on camera. So it just looks like Queen Anne's lace or your parsley or anything else. But this one, it's kind of cool. It can get pink tones on the newer foliage, especially earlier in the season. So it, you can get some different colors to it, uh, yeah. the foliage too. So yeah, um, it, it, pretty foliage. Keep it constrained because it can. Yeah, it can a lot the, like a lot of the water uh, plants, the keeping them constrained. It can conquer the world. So a gr um, water. Can, so I think what I didn't talk about was the containers great. themselves. Um, Alexander will come down here. This right here is just a uh, plastic whiskey barrel mock-up or um, um, fake whiskey barrel, I guess you can call it, that I got. This one is at Costco. Um, so many stores have these now. They're great. They have a nice thick plastic to them, so they're durable. These do not have holes in the bottom. So if you want to use them for a regular container uh, garden, you need to punch holes in them. And of course, for water garden, you don't need to do anything. Some of your other containers, if you get them, that have just the plug, that's there for removal. That does not hold water 100%. So if you need something to um, uh, glue the plug in, try a product called Shugu. That can last over a decade, believe it or not, on just a regular plastic pot. I was totally amazed. I used to use, used to use just regular silicone, and that might last one growing season, but would quite often give up by the, uh, the fall. But the Shugu, I had that on some containers that I put on there over 10 years ago and it's still holding tight and it's still waterproof. And at the garden center I worked at, we actually had a hole in the container and we used duct tape. And it, it held, I don't know how it did, but it, <laughs> I think duct tape's good for anything, isn't it? But use a container that holds water. The largest surface that you can get be better. 
uh, especially if you do a water lily. So this is a cultivar called Colorado. It is uh, described as a medium sized water lily. You definitely want to get smaller ones because they'll stay within the bounds of a container. If you get especially a large one, some of their foliage can be quite large and it's going to grow outside of a container. So they're not often the best uh, plant for a small water garden. Go out and get one that's a much smaller cultivar. Um, your hardy ones probably come in more or come in a, a, a larger array of smaller plants. Tropicals do have some more medium sized plants, but I don't think there's any really good dwarf tropical one out there. The tropicals are great and they really flower extensively, have beautiful foliage to them, but I think they're overall too big for a small water garden container. So try hardy ones. And of course the hardy ones will survive winter, winter to winter or year to year. So it's perfectly fine. Tropicals will not survive in this area. In a container like this, you should not need to protect this in, this, in our area. As long as the water around the base of the plant stays liquid, this plant will not freeze, it'll overwinter. And I actually overwintered it in that container right there, just as a floating tuber held down with a brick. And it was perfectly fine the last winter. So don't worry about them in this area. If you were from uh, much further north, just put them down below the freeze level. A uh, container that's up above ground will freeze faster. Uh, in this area, once again, we're fine, but uh, a little further north, go ahead and protect them. Water, water hyacinth, water lettuce are probably not hardy in this area. They will most likely die. Water lettuce definitely dies. Wa water hyacinth may live on occasion. I've Some, seen it out at the coast. Yeah, at the coast. I was talking about here in yeah. Raleigh. Sometimes it will live in our area. I had it in my front pond a couple of times, survived the winter. All the other plants we mentioned are typically rather hard in this area. One concern for some of these plants, things like cannas and your elephant ears don't like being wet in the winter time. And that's why I keep the container separate also. I just pop the container out. It's naturally drier. It's not sitting in water. It's fine. And Alexander, how about if you aim the camera over there? We'll just talk about a couple of plants over here real quick. This is a calla, and this is one called Green Goddess, Tim? Yeah, Green Goddess. Green Goddess. Zantedicia Ethiopica Green Goddess. And I had one of those in a container on my back porch for several years, and I loved it. I have the one that Tony sells down at Plant Delights. I believe it's called um, uh, White Giant. White Giant White is one Giant. of them. And he has another one that he collected in South Africa, too, and I they can't were, think of the same. It's a beautiful container plant. Huge foliage. The White Giant has little tiny white polka dots on the leaves. It does, mine typically does not flower in the summertime. It would flower very late in the season, like late October, or it would actually flower first thing in the spring. And those were just leftover flowers from the fall when it stopped growing. So that's a great addition. I like to show that one off because it's just a beautiful plant. You can't beat the uh, callas. And that's another example of a plant that does not like it wet in the winter time. We do leave it over there in the pond and it has died on, a, on occasion. Um, so don't leave it in your water. And I think Tim has another one he wants to talk about. I don't know much about this one. This is actually a milkweed. There you go for your pollinator. Yeah, you have a I pollinator mean, water it's garden. not, this isn't the prettiest, but this has been in the cascade for over two years now. It's uh, Asclepius perennis. It's one of our native milkweeds. Cool. So you don't think of them as being a water plant, but it's never gotten big, but it always has some flowers on it through the summer months, so. So that's your water garden plant for your monarchs. Didn't know you could do that, yes. did you? <laughs> And I don't know, you might even try um, Asclepias incarnata, the swamp. Yeah, yeah swamp it's labeled swamp. Which, I would hope yeah, the name would qualify. Weed, so. You never know. And you can even do some woodies if you feel like it. Um, bald cypress. Uh, bald cypress would be a fun one. Get we used a dwarf to have one. a uh, weeping bald cypress over there in the water garden. That was always lovely. That was, that was a great one. That was uh, falling water, wasn't it, that we had? That was falling water. And we had, um, we had a um, Cascade Falls as Cascade well Falls. as... Um, Thomas, what's the one you like? Um, Jim's little guy. Jim's, Jim's little, little guy, guy was over here actually yeah. for about four or five years so before it got planted in the ground. Those in a water garden if you want, uh, in a container water garden. If you Be get one and you don't know what you're going to do with it first, you can uh, hold it in a water yeah, garden. Yeah, you certainly can. So I think that's what we have for today's discussion. We're certainly open for questions. So go ahead and verbally ask your questions. We have speakers here and we can hear you today. Hey, Chris, this is Dennis. Hey, hi, Dennis. Uh, we have some questions about uh, some water plants for small water gardens. And we also have some questions about 
what are some good fish to go with your water plants? Oh, so fish in a container water garden are probably something you don't want to do. The, uh, a small container garden like this uh, half whiskey barrel over here, this might heat up too much for your fish to survive and be all that happy. You could try it, but you might fry your fish. Maybe a little mosquito fish might be fine. Um, there's some fish you might be able to pet store called the rosy red. That might be a fun one. I don't know that one. I, it's actually a top feeder, so they're up above on top of the surface. Another one I've had, I had actually in a back home in Pennsylvania in the summer was a white cloud mountain minnows. They're pretty tolerant. Yep. Uh, they're not quite tolerant enough to stay outside winter through the winter here, but they would reproduce actually in a tub. Those little mosquito fish seem to be really good. Yes. For, um, we have them all through our uh, for other water gardens. Yep. You could probably get away with a goldfish, but it wouldn't I, like the heat. I think a goldfish You'd have in to have a in the shade. no smaller than this yeah. might be okay, especially if there's a lot of leaves yeah. on your 20 gallons or more in, probably for yeah. a, a one or two goldfish. Yeah, so keep them to a minimum. So the mosquito fish, rosy red, and your white mountain. What, um, uh, white uh, cloud mountain minnows. White they're extinct in the wild. Yeah. So, but they're uh, very so common. So go ahead and give those a try. Um, Dennis mentioned small plants. All the ones I mentioned today can be on the big side. So they make really attractive, very leafy water gardens. And I think you have no problem doing any of them in a small container garden. Most of my pots are a little bit smaller than this one at home. And I have all of these in those, or I have had all of them and they work great in there. I wouldn't do anything smaller than this for a water lily. But if you have really small plants, definitely the acorus that we showed would be an awesome one because this is full size. And that's as big as it's going to get in this case. Um, so that's what, about a foot and a half or so. And oh, there's different it. cultivars. There's plain green. There's, there's, there there's are gold. tiny ones of those that only get this tall. You so. can do a fairy water garden with the little tiny dwarf ones out yeah. there. What else? Oh, the floating plants we probably find yes. in a small garden. The um, uh, salvinia that Tim had, the water mm -hmm. hyacinth would be great. The water lettuce be wonderful. If you're not gonna put it in your yard, the chameleon plant will be fine. The hutinia, hutinea, we're gonna pronounce it be fine. I think you'd be okay with lizard's tail. Yeah, but especially this, the variegated or gold leaf one. That, that's a full size plant. That's as big as this one's gonna get. And it's, it's kept in bounds because it's just inside of a, a small one quart four and a half inch pot or so. If it makes shoots towards the base, just cut them off. But this has been in this pot for <laughs> at least two years. And I think this one might be three years old. So that's not gonna get too big. The uh, the sword that we showed, that <laughs> that might eat your water garden for dinner overnight. So that, that one gets Something big. you might try to get some flowers, maybe Lobelia cardinalis. Oh yeah, we didn't talk about Lobelia. Lobelia cardinalis. Um, and, and that's a mid-size, I mean, you might like get two um, to three feet if it's yeah. really happy. But. but that one's super narrow. That's just an yeah. upright stalk with leaves that pop off the side that might be four inches tall. So that's just a vertical element. And I think you could probably get, typically the, the species is red, but you can get some of the hybrids. Yep. Um, uh, guard, uh, I forget what they're called at this moment, but anyways, you can get some purples and whites. And I, pink I grew when that was a hybrid well. in my pond, and I'm forgetting the name of it, but it's one that had the purple foliage. Uh, there's a whole bunch of purple foliage, yeah. like the old one, is it Queen of Victoria? It was, was something like that. I think that. was the original dark leafed um, red flower one, but there's ones with purple flowers and, and white flowers and pink flowers as well. So. And um, I'm just gonna go back onto something. One thing I didn't mention that I think it's just a little fun thing. If you oh. have a, a spiky thing, kind of like this, or maybe even thalia, for instance, dragonflies will land oh, yeah. on top of the spikes. And you want dragonflies to be around for your water gardens. You also want them around for yourself. Dragonflies eat the mosquitoes as they're flying around. And when they lay their eggs down in the water gardens, the nymphs will eat the uh, mosquito larvae. So they attract, water, or attract the um, dragonflies. If you don't have anything spiky, just those uh, four inch tall bamboo spikes just put near your gardens. Um, that makes a great landing spot for your dragonflies. They'll just hang out on those. Uh, they work out great for that. I thought of another smaller uh, water lily equivalent, nymphoides, uh, yeah. which I can't think what they're commonly called, but there's one, uh, some native to the coast. They're water uh, snowflakes, I think. That's it. Yeah. Um, and uh, they, there's some yellow species and white flowered species. Yep. They're just small flowers, but they have the lily pad look. And you can find one of them. The, one of the native ones is Their Nymphoides leaves. aquatica, which is commonly sold as banana plant in yep. a uh, in an aquarium. A pet store. In pet stores, yeah. So, so their leaves, Tim, I think are no Might bigger get, than yes, this Yes, they're one. smaller than that typically. Yep. I've seen them growing wild in the croton. 
And they um, often have patterns on them too. Yes, they can. So they're, they're really- But rough. those would be good for a smaller, um, a, 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 smaller than a water lily, but yeah. get that same look. You, you could fit probably a yellow one and a white one and There's something else red flowered. I thought there was. Uh, it's orange. not that, but it's a different genera. And I can't think what it is. They have it at the North Carolina Botanic Garden oh, in cool. their, their water gardens. I can never remember what it is, but it gets little burgundy red flowers. They're about, only about this big. So and yeah, they have you, a, a leaf like that. If I'd you have want to look a small water lily like plant, that'd be great. The other nice thing is they're available at your pet store and they're probably a lot cheaper. Water lilies, if you're lucky, you can maybe you'll find them from a friend for free. Um, sometimes water lilies can be maybe found for $15 as a bare root plant, but more than likely be paying at least $30 for a potted plant, if not higher than that. And when I was uh, just looking online recently, I think I saw one for at least 90. So they, they can go pretty high pretty fast. Another one that's gonna give you some floating leaves as well as submerged leaves is, I don't know if you can see this, but a Ponta gentum. They're used in an aquarium industry. Um, you can buy them as dry bulbs. Can you see it? Hopefully Dennis can type that. But a Ponta gentum, we used to have uh, one of the species, I can't remember which one, in the white garden. It's uh, one of the more hardier ones. It's from Southern Africa. Uh, but it'll, uh, it'll flower here in the winter, actually. Oh, oh, yeah, um, that's... Um... Water hawthorn. Yes, water okay, hawthorn. I, I didn't recognize the name. But that's another species. But this, you can get these really cheap. I got a whole little jar of the, like four or five of these at, I think, PetSmart for my aquarium. But they form floaters. Oh, cool. And then they get little smaller flower spikes yep. than the, um, what do you call it again? Water. Um, uh, uh, snowflake. No, the um, the Apuntagentum that we just talked about that used to be in. Oh, wa well, that was, that water, was water hawthorn. In water there. hawthorn. Yeah. I, yeah, smaller than the water hawthorn. But. It will grow in a small um, tub as well. So, so Tim mentioned while the hawthorn flowers in the summer or winter time, it actually goes either dormant. near dormant or totally dormant in the summertime. So it's the opposite. So you could do something like the water snowflake in a water garden and then have your water hawthorn for the winter time. And speaking of small, we're going to go over here and just show the lotus, Alexander. The water lotus is this one with the large, just pure circle leaf. And that would actually make an interesting garden plant as well. You can grow it in a container like our whiskey barrel. In that case, you'd actually want to take your whiskey barrel, fill the whole bottom half with soil, plant your lotus in that, and then add the um, water on top of it. Lotus typically, and that's that size lotus, typically need a much larger container they spread very quickly, so you have to plant, or you should plant them in a circle container because their runners will just spin around in circles forever in a circle container. If you plant them in a squared off container, they will hit a corner and they can bounce out of the container. So do them in a circle. But the reason I brought them up was to answer that person's question. There are teacup lotus that you can grow in really small, diminutive sized pots in very small container gardens. So they can come from very small sized plants all the way up to giant ones that can have leaves this big that are over six feet tall out of the water. So a huge array of sizes. So look for teacup lotuses or even just miniature lotus for a small water garden. It'd be a fun option. They have a more limited flowering season than water lilies. They often flower for maybe about six weeks or so. And it's about now is when they're flowering. They do slow down at the end of summer and don't flower again in the fall. But they're the ones that have those really awesome funnel shaped seed pods that look like a honeycomb on the flat surface with the little circle beads that kind of shake. So that, that actually is a lotus flower. They uh, want lots more sun than we yes. don't have enough light for them anywhere more over here. That lotus we just showed you is in far too much shade. Lotus absolutely requires six hours of direct sunlight to flower and grow well. And water lilies love sun as well. Full sun, most of the plants we discussed today want full sun. So grow them in full sun. I don't know about the um, water snowflake. That one might go with a little bit of shade. I think full sun probably the probably. best, but part shade might be tolerated. If, if you think about your lakes out there where the plants are native to, there's not a lot of trees growing in them to offer shade. And that's why they all like a lot of sun. How about more questions, Dennis? Anyone have any more questions? Yeah, there was a question uh, uh, with a recommend, asking for a recommendation uh, if snails would be good uh, to use. And if you had any recommendations for snails. Well, you normally don't need to worry about wildlife that, like that. Yeah, you could put snails in there, but I'll bet you anything that your water plants that you get already come with snails. Yeah. 
So whether you knew it or not, they have snails. There's some minuscule ones actually in here yep. that I, I brought Chris when my It's kind of a, uh, your You'll never see them. <laughs> might come with a little egg case. It's kind of a little gelatinous thing just stuck to it. That snail egg's right there. So you don't need to worry about that. Every time that I've built a water garden, I've usually had a frog or toad in it by the next morning. So you don't even need to worry about Build that. Build it and they will come. Yes, so that, that definitely applies for the water garden. So I wouldn't worry about snails, you get them. You can do some of your larger um, pet store snails if you want. They might eat your water lilies though. Uh, the little tiny small black ones, they don't eat the water lilies, but the big ones can. And definitely don't do those invasive snails. What is an African snail? Those, those are giant, those aren't are, aquatic anyways. Yeah, they're not aquatic, I guess. So don't, I wouldn't do any exotic snails outside in the water garden. You'll, you'll get them, don't worry. I was speaking of the devil. How about more snail. questions? I think Tim just stepped on a snail. <laughs> <laughs> not a water garden snail, I think it was a, terrestrial snail destined for a hosta somewhere right yes more questions folks got one dennis anyone else yeah snakes and water gardens uh do, do water gardens attract them uh the only wildlife that is bigger like that that my backyard water gardens attracted was turtles oh yep i had a red-eared turtle that came by one year and laid eggs and it turned out it was the same year that we had our first big batch of koi babies. And we wound up having six, six red-eared turtle babies in the pond and the little babies ate all of the koi babies. But you're not likely to have those in a- Which, which actually lucked out because it, you already had a full pond of koi, didn't need more. You're not likely to have that in a, uh, a container. In a container, a container, no, you're not really gonna get them in a container. container. This was just a water garden outside. I doubt you'd have snakes either. I mean, we occasionally have a garter snake go by or a black rat snake, which we have throughout the garden here at the Arboretum, but I've never, we've never had water snakes here in the garden. The, um, the so. tree frogs are the highest animal form that I have seen in my water garden plants. With yeah. the tree frog. Somewhere over here, we have uh, a couple great big bullfrogs, you know. Oh, they're great. Uh, there's at least two or three of them over here. I saw them yesterday, so. But in that case, they'll actually enjoy the tree frogs. At least hopefully they will. They have a beautiful little chirp and they just chirp uh, forever. So it's it's very attracted wildlife and frogs are always good. Toads will also uh, yeah. probably come in out here. Not, and not, not when a, we had evening, oh, not so much Not, in, those, not in a container, it's too high for it's a It's too toad. high, yeah. okay. But I know out here, if, when we have evening <clears throat> programming yes. in the past and uh, they'd be out here there's the frog. Oh yeah, someone's calling oh, over there. Yeah. But uh, we will have toads lining this, chirping yeah. uh, in the evening. So. Toads aren't as nice when they chirp because they sound like uh, people screaming for their dear life. How about more questions? Anyone have any more additional questions? Any special, any special water treatment? Uh, no, um, when, I, when I brought this container here, this container had been sitting with water on it for um, a couple of weeks already, or actually over a full month. I never change it out. You just add water to it. If you, if you change water, you can be ruining the, um, uh, the biological system in it. It's gonna be full of bacteria and other goodness down in there. So don't, don't mess with your water. At the end of the season, you can clear your container out. Just, just leave it alone. Do you just do any dechlorinators? Um, if you have things like fish and you add water, you're gonna need to dechlorinate it. Mine doesn't have fish in it, so I just add tap water to it. And I've never noticed things like the um, dragonfly larva uh, or nymphs uh, getting killed by the chlorine fish will, but I've never noticed a little subterranean life getting killed by it for some reason. Even tadpoles, uh, I'll get tadpoles in those from the tree frogs all the time and they, they seem fine. But you're not, you're not also adding two, three, no. four inches on a daily basis. You might come by once a week and add an inch. I can't even tell the last time I added water to that one, it's been raining so much, so. Dechlorinate it, but don't clean it. Even your water guards at home should not be cleaned all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, if you clean them, you're ruining your balance. You'll probably have a green pond anyway. Just leave it alone. It'll eventually balance out and, and should turn clean with time. It needs to cycle. Yeah, it needs to have a good cycle to it. How about more questions? Uh, how do you guard against mosquitoes growing? Well, we showed that a little while ago. I'll show it again, because it's an important one. So uh, a body like this, once it gets the dragonfly larva, won't have the mosquitoes. They will eat them. Until you get to that point, you can use mosquito dumps, but I would recommend their similar product. It's called Mosquito Bits. 
kind of like bacon bits, but this is mosquito <laughs> bits made out of uh, a little bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's bacteria, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, a little bacteria. Uh, this will kill them. You just sprinkle a little bit inside your water garden, um, just like you're putting bacon bits on a salad, and that will kill them. And I mentioned earlier, too, that this will also kill fungus gnats in your potted plants inside your house. So it's a dual purpose thing. So that'll take care of them uh, with no issues at all and super quickly, and you'll have no problem with them. Uh, my garden. Hey, uh, what? It's Suzanne. Edney. Hi, Suzanne. I had a pond and I didn't have any filtration going. And I used the water lettuce, lettuce and the water hyacinth yep. exclusively for filtering. And I had a very clear pond. I just had to weed, weed them out every once in a while, not putting them in the regular, you know, in any place else, but just the it's, compost. It's compost them. Exactly. Yeah. You're, the, yeah. the, the floating water plants and all those submerged ones are great water filters. You can't beat them for what they do to keep your water clean. Um, but containers like this, you don't need a pump in them. Moving water does not work out with a water lily. Their stomates are on top of the leaf blade and that is where they live, or that's how they breathe, excuse me. So if you have splashing water always on your water lilies, they're gonna drown, they can't handle it. So nice still water on them. That's why you don't see any water lilies through here because they just can't handle it. Also it's far too shaded so they would die anyway. Um, but still water works out great. You don't need moving water. Moving water is mostly for your fish to keep the water just really oxygenated because most water gardens have far too many fish inside of them. Our water garden over here is what, like 20 comets at most or so? No, there might be more is, than that. Now there's some babies that you can't see. There's a see. few babies. So not many at all. Whereas my garden pond at home, thanks to a big batch of koi babies a year or two ago, has far too many. We have to keep that pond aerated for them. And also our front pond, which is much smaller than this one here at the Arboretum and has as many fish inside of it. So we keep those aerated. Aerating the water does not keep the water clear. Next question. What about watercress? Um, I don't think I've ever grown watercress. I've never grown it either. I, um, yep. I think it's, it's in the Brassicaceae. It's in the cabbage family, if Is I remember it? right. But I've never, never grown it. I would think it would be a cool season plant. I think it is, yeah. So I don't know how it grows. It grows wild in, you know, either uh, still or fast water, usually fast, in the yeah. sun or shade. Yeah, I've never grown it. Worth a try if you can find it. Could be a good yeah. one. And the uh, going going back to Suzanne's comments about the water highest and water lettuce, if you can have a flow below their root system, they get even more nutrients delivered to them and they will really Actually, grow fast. That's why those were so big. Yep, that's because why those, those were, were so right big. right below the, the falls out in the stepping stone. Yeah, they just have continuous nutrients and um, um, oxygen delivery to the root system. So they they can grow really fast in those cases. How many more questions? Chris, yeah. we've got, yep. um, someone wants to know if we've ever seen herons here and someone else yes. also wants some recommendations for wa suppliers of water, water plants. Yes, we have herons here. We probably would have had more fish in here if it weren't for the herons, especially uh, during the um, shutdown. I'd come in here in the morning and there'd be a heron sitting on the edge of the, the, the the water garden, the cascade here. Um, so yeah, we get them occasionally. So herons can do a lot of damage really fast. They can, they can go through almost every fish in your water garden in a matter of a day or two. So they can be a problem. Uh, at my home water garden, I don't have problems with the herons in small containers like this, but then again, I don't have fish in them. So that's perfectly fine. But we do get them in our ponds and the herons typically in my yard come in the winter time, usually yeah. starting in November because the overhead trees kind of block the pond and they don't see them anywhere near as much. When the trees lose their leaves, then the ponds are more visible and then they know where the garden pond is and they can come in and wipe you out really fast. You can cover your pond with a net, it's not fun, or you can just buy new fish the next spring because <laughs> they'll get them really fast. And I've already forgotten the other question. Ooh, supplies. Oh, uh, water garden supplies, it's, it's, it's been a long time since I last bought a water garden plant, so I could be rather rusty. Most of the garden centers here in the Raleigh area used to have water garden plants. I'm not too sure if they still do. I have now had two people call me this year alone asking for a local source for water lilies. And I told them the local stores and they said, no, they don't have them. And from the sound of it, it sounds like they actually got rid of their water garden departments, if you will. So I'm not too sure if they're even available locally. 
but try a mail order. Yeah, There's or a lot. not mail. How about the internet? Internet. Yeah, it's mail order. Yeah. <laughs> try, try, try your internet stores. There's really good sources. Um, even looking the other night, I even saw someone had something on Etsy. Yeah. So you can get them. If, if you get a really good, reputable uh, dealer, they should get you a nice, healthy plant that may not come with any problems, uh, hopefully, on it. Uh, I do have to say that one time, many, many years ago, I got a water lily from a company up further north, and it came with leeches on it. And that did not make me happy. I didn't know we had leeches on it until it was too late. And they were already in the pond. They were just little tiny ones, so they weren't too bad. We didn't have gargantuan leeches in the pond. Yeah, they were, they were, they were gross. Um, my favorite company, but it's also one just because I lived in the same state, was a company called Lily Ponds, L-I-L-Y, and then P-O-N-S, named after, I believe, an opera singer. And they have a, a location in Texas, and the other one's up in Maryland, and they were a great supplier of water garden plants. But there's many of them out there. Uh, just search the internet, type in Waterly Sale, and you'll get them. I don't know if you'll find too many this late in the season. They may already be sold out. So but. Lotus, you cannot buy at this time of the year unless it's already potted because they don't do them bare root. They only do bare root first thing in the spring. Water lilies, you can get bare root typically into the summer. Whether they're shipping or not, I don't know. Uh, but a lot of those places will sell potted plants at this time. Maryland's not too far away if you want a long day trip, if you will. And they're kind of fun to visit. Here in North Carolina, I forget the name of the company, but there is one up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to say it's Strawn, but it's not Strawn. I forget who the breeder was. He retired to North Carolina from Florida and retirement didn't stick. And he wound up starting a whole entire new water garden company. He's a very famous breeder. The gardens are wonderful to visit. Um, I don't know if you need to call ahead. I can't remember that, but it's just fun seeing them all together. They're pretty cool. Uh, and the International Water Lily Collection, if you may not know it even exists, is very close to the National Arboretum, just wow. north of, um, uh, well, the Arboretum itself in it's D.C. A, it's, a the, it's a national park. It's along the Anacostia. Yeah, it? it is. But it's its own little tiny little <laughs> national park, and they have a water, uh, a water lily festival or a lotus festival every year. So that's not too far away. So go ahead and try that. Uh, but as you can see with some of these plants, they're just garden plants. You can get canna anywhere. You can get uh, the elephant ears anywhere, too. And I think even big bloomers might have some aquatics. They could. Uh, it's the possible. Saracena. The, yes. Um, I mean, you could, those you don't really do submerged. The, yep. the you want the, maybe the roots immersed, but not the, the base of the plant. Yep. They That'd want to be, be cool damp, not, um, not f flooded. How about the next question? Anything else? Chris. Yep. Um, a couple people are asking about, about fish still. Uh, for a tub like that, you could put in guppies, believe it or not. Yeah. Yep. Shiners. You can go collect some uh, native killifish and put it in there. Endlers. Any of those really small aquarium fish will work in a tub 25 gallons or more. A lot of those are live bears and they actually, they'll go to the surface and breathe too. So they don't really need yeah. heavily oxygenated water. So that's yeah. why they do work real well. And I was sticking my answer to the ones I knew would overwinter. I don't know if things yeah, like the guppies. The guppies the won't overwinter thing. here, um, but their cousin, which are native here, the mosquito fish, the gimbuzis. Yeah, yeah. Shiners are overwinter too. Yeah. yeah. And those, those I think, those might be, I don't know what they're related to. They're, uh, they're typically in the streams. So. Well, they're in the stream. They may not like a little still body of water, but you never know. Give it a try. Um, I mentioned the um, rosy reds earlier. They might be a fun one to try because they are kind of a um, salmon color. So they might be visible. And they're also at the top of the water far more frequently. The normal uh, goldfish, they're bottom feeders. So they're usually down low, whereas the rosy reds are up high. The um, white cloud mountain minnows I mentioned before, there's gold form of those. The, the wild type is kind of olive and would blend right in. But the gold form, they, you'd be able to see them from the surface. And they come to the surface. All right, well, thanks for the suggestion. Any other questions? Not on my end, no. Well, Dennis is quiet and sounds like no one else is chiming in. So that sounds like it's the end of today's program. Thank you so much for joining us and learning a little bit how to create a uh, container garden in your, uh, in your own home landscape for water garden plants. Hope some of you take advantage of growing some water garden plants on your back porch, your front porch, wherever you want, because they're a lot of fun and they're just some really cool plants. Enjoy the rest of your day. Let's hope the rain comes by and it gives yeah. us a little bit of sprinkles. It looks like it's going south. Oh, that's It's not coming towards the arboretum, unfortunately. I looked.
Well, have fun, everyone. We'll see you next week, Wednesday at 3 o'clock, for a great Plantsman's Tour with Doug. See you then. Thank you. Thanks.